In this video, we are going to talk about PCB materials because uh, sometimes uh, you can choose from different materials. For example, FR4 is like very well known material, but do we or shall we use also different kind of materials when we are creating step, uh, stack up or when we should use these kind of different materials, when we should think about uh, using different materials and then you know, how we are going to pick them. And that's what Alun is going to uh, help us to understand today in this video. Thank you very much, Alan, for this. It's my pleasure. So I think we are going to start with the main thing. So uh, what is the main reason behind using different materials? I think one of the main reasons is uh, loss. That's what we see on this uh, slide, or am I wrong? Yes, absolutely. Um, so um, the the thing we have to consider mainly is which material is most appropriate for the for the design. Um, if we look back, you know, some years, it wasn't really a big issue. Uh, designs were running at fairly low speeds. FR4 was fine for, for nearly everything. We're talking there of, you know, uh, testing at one, one megahertz, for example. And if you think back to the 1980s, you know, the first PCs were running at 4.7 or thereabouts megahertz. So now we talk, of course, of gigahertz. We talk of tens of gigahertz, even hundreds of gigahertz. So there's a there's quite a different arena now um, for the material properties. And this slide just shows uh, an idea um, uh, in simulated eye diagrams between uh, what happens when you think about the loss in the material. So there's a number of aspects to this, and we we will of course cover cover these uh, in our in our talk today. Um, the thinking thinking first of all. Um, the actual material is absorbing energy. Mm -hmm. So when you put a signal, you know, through a, through a circuit in whatever way, an AC signal, which is what we are discussing here, you're losing energy as, you, as you're passing through. And depending on the frequency, depending on the material, depends how much we lose. So just for interest, the, the slides on here uh, uh, give, give a kind of... Um, a kind of bound to the the story. So the basic thing is, if we look at the you know the bottom of the of the eye on the diagram here, and look at the top, we're going from zero to one basically. Let's let's put it as simple as that: the digital signal, and you want to have discrimination. You want to know what is zero and what is one. So if there's some noise superimposed upon the signal, the beauty of a digital signal, of course, is that you can you can discriminate that noise away completely. So you say anything that's uh, between. Let me say if the range was let's say for, for sake of argument, five volts between uh, naught, uh, naught is zero volts and, and one is five volts. Anything between naught and one volt, you can say is a zero. Anything between four and five volts, you can say is a one. And you can make an absolutely clean signal that's pure if you use that kind of filter. The problem is, of course, uh, you need to have this, this discrimination, you need to have a big enough eye. And there are, in that example I gave, there are no signals uh, high, higher than one volt and less than less than four volts in that middle part. So therefore, there's nothing to think about. But if you start getting losses, though, you start to degrade the signal to some degree, and then it gets a bit more confusing. So the, the next chart I'm showing there is zero dielectric loss. This is basically saying that the loss we have here is all in the conductors, all in the copper. And I'll mm -hmm. explain later what that actually means. But you see already this wonderful eye we had, you know, from the bottom to the top there has now been pretty much halved. So we've lost pretty much half of our discrimination just by putting a copper on there, which is a pretty, pretty difficult thing to imagine. If we then move on to standard FR4, we have quite a high loss in standard FR4. Uh, I'll explain the number later on. But have a look at this one here, this picture. Uh, I would like to, I'm sorry for interrupting. Yes. So just to imagine, uh, uh, are we talking about some kind of relative numbers or can we put some uh, like absolute numbers like for, uh, I don't know, this kind of loss yes. will happen after, I don't know, 10 centimeters or three inches or... A... Yeah, so, so in this case, the, 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 um, the loss factor is, is, is dimensionless. So it's difficult to, to give that, um, you know, to give that um, in any other way but the number that, that, that's displayed. But we're talking here of a, of a five mil track with this 35 picosecond rise time. So this is, this is not unusual. Uh, five mil tracks uh, exist, you know, very widely. Um, and we're looking here, I think the distance is, um, it doesn't say on the chart, I think it's around uh, 10 inches, I think, the, the, the trace. So a number of inches, not a very long trace uh, on a circuit board, so not having to go off the circuit board. So this is a real situation that would occur on a circuit board of normal size uh, with, you know, normal size tracks uh, with a standard FR4. Mm -hmm. The problem that you see straight away is, if you would use a standard FR4 for this kind of application, you know, five, oh, hang on, it's, it's one meter, sorry. Yes, I see, I see it's one, one meter. 
It's a bit longer than I thought it was. Um, How red do you see it? Sorry, it's at the top here. I, I, I thought it was on the chart. I just found it. <laughs> ah, okay. So, ah, okay. That's, oh, okay. Okay. But my apologies for that. I thought it was a, a little bit less, but one meter, uh, 50 ohms impedance. Again, this doesn't really matter. It's just a standard that we use. But on, on a circuit, you would find this kind of loss uh, in a, a meter long is a fairly big circuit board, obviously, um, but it will be a back plane, something along, along those lines where you might see this. But you would really get to the point on standard FR4 when you couldn't use that material to pass this signal, because if you see the, the during here, the eye is completely closed now. Mm -hmm don't know which is a one and which is a zero you can't discriminate anymore and that is quite a big a big issue so if we just take that scenario and say okay we still want to run with these frequencies we still want to run with this this uh, this pulse rate and the sa same size of track and the and the rise time we've talked about what about we improve the material what about we make the the df so the dissipation factor which i will go on later to explain a bit more about what if we go from 0.02 to 0.012 so nearly half the the dissipation factor then you actually do get somebody of an eye opening up probably still not usable but if you go to the next one 008 then suddenly you've got a, a bit of an eye appearing again so there is some discrimination you can say these are ones and these are zeros and we have a bit of a gap if you go to 0 0.003 which is let me say pretty much as good as it can get. It can get slightly better, but that kind of range. Then you get back pretty much to a window, the same as zero, zero dielectric loss. So the way to mitigate this issue of the uh, the loss and the and the signal integrity is to use a a better uh, material which has a lower dissipation factor. And a word of caution here, though, because um, you could just say, well, let's just use this low loss material for everything. You know, obviously, the thing to do is just take the best material and use it for all all designs. It doesn't really work quite that way, though. The, the problems are when you start to use these materials, they can be quite specialised. They can be quite difficult to manufacture with. And, and of course, the most important point is they cost more money. Mm -hmm. So it could be that you over-specify uh, on your design and you can, if you do that, make your whole design perhaps uneconomically viable and you may destroy your design by doing that. So it's very important to, to pick the material that works for your, for your application and not to over or under specify. So that I think would be the would be the main message here that we, we don't over or under specify. Otherwise, we might kill our design and we may not be able to even get the product to market because we put it in the right price in the wrong price category or we can't find super manufacturers to produce that kind of material to those kinds of tolerances. So I think that is an important, important message to come across. Mm -hmm. I would like to just uh, add uh... Some time ago, I created a video where we like exactly simulated transmission line for different kind of materials. So if uh, someone is uh, interested to see really specific numbers, like uh, when I still can use FR4 for how short tracks or uh, when I uh, need to really consider maybe uh, how to use or when to use different materials, then uh, they can watch this kind of video. But we are really talking about small distances when this will play a uh, role for these higher frequencies. We are talking maybe about 5 gigahertz and more. Uh, or, or is this also important for like uh, frequencies below uh, 1 gigahertz? Or? Well, yes, because there's an influence at all frequencies, in fact. And the, the, uh, the, the important thing here is there are lots of factors at play. So I've just given here some dielectric loss figures. Um, and you see zero dielectric loss. Even with zero dielectric loss, we have losses in the conductor. Yeah. So the copper itself is also giving us a problem, uh, as is the reinforcement. So the material is basically made of, of, of three, three parts. If I can just go to a, a slide just to explain, uh, the, let's say, the way the materials are built yeah, up, yeah, that okay. would be helpful. So let's just, um, let's just come to here. Um, so we can think of a printed circuit based material. This is a kind of definition. So we have an insulating material with a conductor bonded to one or both sides. That's the first thing. So insulator and conductors. But the insulator itself is normally a composite material and that normally has a, a resin and a reinforcement. So there are multiple materials that we're looking at here. And of course, the uh, the, the conductor can also be other than copper, although actually 99 percent of the time it is copper. And if you think about the, the manufacturing um, cycle of how, how we actually do this, bring the material together, there are the, the three raw materials that are used in PCB, manufacture, PCB material manufacture, glass fabric, resin, and copper foil. 
And the way we do this is we take the resin and we coat it onto the glass fabric in a, in a machine called an impregnator, quite a large piece of equipment. Uh, and, we, and we then take this material and put copper both sides of it. And then we put it in a big press, we heat it up and we, and we melt the resin and we bond it all together. And then we finish the product. So that's the, the kind of process um, that we go through. So um, this, is, this is basically core material, what we are talking about. Yes, exactly. Core material. Um, and of course, we stick these things together. I mean, we are used to using multi-layer circuits these days. Uh, originally, there were only just two sides, the top and the bottom. But of course, you can get 40 layers, 70 layers, whatever you like these days, uh, using different technologies. So it's also possible to buy uh, what's called a pre-preg, so uh, a pre-impregnated glass fabric, which is like the building block, a kind of gluing layer. So we just stop at this point. So we call this B stage. A is uh, liquid, B is uh, semi semi uh, cured, so like a gluing layer, if you like, and then C is fully cured. So there are three stages to this, and we can use these layers to build the material up. And of course, we can use different resins in those materials. We can also use different reinforcements. We sometimes have no reinforcements. You know, there are a number of technologies now, so-called build-up technologies, that would actually not use reinforcements at all for a number of reasons. Um, so. You have to imagine, uh, first of all, there are there are a number of choices to be made here. And if I just come on to perhaps a slide like this, uh, just explaining some of the resin systems that can be used. There are quite a, quite a broad range of systems. If we look back a few years, though, there weren't very many at all. Epoxy resin is what we are So that's quite the FR4, uh, that's what I wanted to ask. So exactly. That's why we have all the kind of different resins, because they have different yes. properties and we can achieve, yes. for example, or different exactly. losses or, okay. And, and typically, uh, you know, go, going back uh, when this was all, all sort of um, embryonic, back in the 1960s, when the definitions were made, of course, uh, high speed didn't really didn't really matter. It wasn't a big concern because there weren't many things running at high speed. So generally, epoxy resins and phenolic resins were the most widely used. And then polyamide came onto the scene. Polyamide we've probably heard about in space and, uh, and defense contexts. Um, this is a high reliability material, as is this uh, BT, which is a kind of derivation of it. Um, <clears throat> and these were used because they, uh, if I put it in simple terms, they were considered to be soldier proof. So these materials are very thermally strong. So soldiers can repair them in the field with, mm. you know, with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, blow torches or whatever. So pretty, pretty indestructible materials. So they will not so, like peel off or something? Say again? They will not peel off between the layers? No, uh, uh, not, not, not too much, no. And, and you can actually go through much higher thermal cycles. That's the main thing. So you can actually, with these materials, you can solder a component on, you can make a mistake, take it off, put it back on again, and you can do field repairs <clears throat> on these materials. So they're very robust, very strong materials. Um, but of course, uh, everything has a compromise here. So even though these materials are, are very, uh, very robust and very widely used, and still today, by the way, in space and defense, because of those reasons, there are some compromises. Um, first of all, uh, the price is, is one compromise, but even beyond that, they're quite lossy. So polyamide resins uh, don't work especially well at high frequencies. Mm -hmm. which doesn't typically matter for many applications and space and defense it's fairly conservative. Um, you don't see often the, the leading edge of technology in these applications because reliability is the number one concern, especially in space. You can carry out no repairs in space, basically. So um, you want to find something you've really tested and you're really sure works and has worked for a number of number of years with certain designs. And again, military wants the things to work. They don't need to be leading edge. They just need to actually, actually work when they're supposed to. <clears throat> so you find that still occurring. But new designs, for example, uh, space now is, of course, using much higher frequencies. We've seen all the, the low Earth orbit uh, satellites, you know, the, uh, the um, uh, uh, Starlink and, um, you know, various communication satellites building and building now. And of course, we are using higher frequencies. If we think about the where we're going now with the, the 5G networks, for example, you know, we're already at sort of in the range of one to six gigahertz. Um, as the radio frequency. Now we're talking about going to the so-called high band, which is 24 gigahertz and above. So we are going to need to actually use materials with much lower mm -hmm. loss. If we use these old materials, these polyamide materials, we will suffer the, uh, the degradation that I showed you on the previous slide. So we want to try and avoid that. And now many other materials are being, are being qualified for space use. So even though these are still high reliability and very good materials, we are moving into this kind of next category of PPO, uh, polyphenylene oxide materials, PTFE, other hydrocarbons. So a whole range of materials that are designed specifically 
to be high speed and low loss, but also still have pretty good properties in terms of thermal performance. Mm -hmm. When these were being designed, you know, um, people didn't sort of throw everything away. They, they wanted to keep, of course, the, the thermal performance as well. So there's a whole range there. And the last bit is blends and multi-phase systems. And I think, um, you know, if, if I'm being uh, straightforward here, um, most systems now have many components. You have very, very few uh, single component systems now. They contain all kinds of things. So we do have uh, performance modifiers, we have fillers, we have all kinds of additional products in there designed to give us not just the reinforcement for mechanical purposes, but actually to fine tune electrical properties as well and thermal properties. But then uh, still how uh, PCB design engineer can decide which one to use. They send. They should send you an email and ask, like, I'm designing for space, which one would you recommend? <laughs> well, that, 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 that is a really good point, actually, and, and I'm, I'm really pleased you brought it up. Um, that's exactly how we should be doing it. Okay. <laughs> uh, exactly, and I've been arguing the case for some years now. Um, if we look at our specifications, they go back to the 1960s, and they defined everything based on chemistry. So, uh, you know, epoxy resins, phenolic, poly, whatever, all these different chemistries. And, uh, and, and that actually is of no interest to the designer whatsoever. He has no idea what any of this stuff means. He cares about performance. Performance is what really matters. And, you know, I think the, the trend that we're, we're trying to sort of uh, work on now is to try and curate these materials into, the, into those kind of usage categories. So, for example, if I was an automotive design engineer, and I want to design something for my vehicle. I might want to be working in the cabin, for example. So I know the kind of uh, you know environment we're working in the cabin, and we could then provide a set of uh, materials to say, okay, if you're designing in the cabin, these are the kind of materials that you should probably use. So instead of being faced with a list of perhaps a hundred plus materials from the specification viewpoint, you might be presented with only three or four materials, and you could then choose relatively between these. If you're designing under hood, for example. Uh, where you have, uh, say, probably uh, high temperatures to deal with, uh, some other uh, conditions like that, and perhaps uh, high voltage. There could be other other reasons, especially with EVs, of course, now we're looking at much higher voltages than we've been used to using. So, you know, we have you have over, over a kilovolt now in, in vehicles um, many times. So, again, rather than choose from the sort of, you know, 100 or so different material categories, you get presented with three or four choices. And I think that really is the way forward. So I suppose maybe I could... Talk a little bit about the about the losses in general, and uh, just to give a um, a bit of an idea. Okay. Um, if this so let's will go be... back to losses and uh, uh, yeah. so everyone so, understand basically uh, how these losses are happening and what is yes, happening. exactly. Okay, exactly. So I can explain a little bit about, about how it happened. So you know there are th there are two real losses in materials. One is the, the resistive I squared R losses that we're we're very familiar with, and here we try to reduce the current, of course. Um, to reduce that. And so these are the, in the conductor, the in, in, the, in, the, in the conductor, exactly, yes, in the conduction. Uh, but if we look at the dielectric itself, so the insulator part, we also have losses. And this is caused by the, by the varying field uh, produced by the alternating current. And I can just show an example of how that looks here. So these materials we use are poor conductors. That's the idea, you know, we want them to be insulating. Uh, and they're, they're insulators because they carry very few electrons. So there's very few electrons in the material. And if you look at the material, uh, unpolarized, you get the copper layers here. The green is the bulk of the material and little dipoles in there. So the chemical structure has slightly positive bits and slightly negative bits, just very slightly unpolarized. Of course, when we polarize this, when we actually pass a current through, mm -hmm. which is positive on the top and negative on the bottom, like uh, this, for example, you suddenly find these little tiny micro domains line up which means basically we are causing some kinetic effect within the material, this small movement of, 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 of molecules, um, just to line it with the, with, the, with the electrical field. And of course, if we then reverse the field, then they go the other way. So they go back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. And this kind of kinetic action is absorbing energy. It requires mm -hmm. energy to make this movement. And that energy we see as heat. So that is exactly how we how we find the the losses in the material. Just so by ideally, heat. you would like to have a material without as less or as few movement as possible, because then there will Perfect. be okay. But that's exactly the uh, the point. So we try to find something that, that doesn't get very well polarized, and there's a way of measuring that. Uh, we call this dipole moment. So um, how long is this dipole? How, how much is this, is this dipole? Of course, overall, the charge is zero in, in, in materials, but these little tiny, tiny micro changes uh, give rise to this, this dipole moment. And we can actually um, imagine that with a very simple example. Um, the microwave oven is using exactly this 
this property to heat things up. And the reason is the water has a dipole moment. Water has a slightly negative charge on the oxygen atom and it has a slightly positive charge on the hydrogen atoms. So when you, when you pass uh, an alternating current by this, when you get this positive peak here, the negative lines up more or less. When we then dip through zero and go to the negative part of the cycle, the, the, the water molecule switches around. So the, the hydrogen goes up to the top and that constant oscillation back and forth, back and forth is why things get warm I when you might know. I didn't know. Exactly that. <laughs> and, um, and just as an interesting thing, you can take some materials, take a bit of FR4 laminate, not with copper on, by the way, uh, we don't want to put metals in our microwave ovens, put it in your oven, turn the oven on for a minute and pull the material out. You'll find it's got hot. Why is that? Because it's polarizable. There are little domains in there that are going back and forth. Take some low loss material, for example, let me say PTFE for an example, which is very low loss. Put that in the oven for, for an hour. That's an hour, a minute, whatever, whatever time you like. <laughs> an hour would actually work, by the way. It wouldn't get hot because there's hardly any dipole moment in there. So you can tell straight away. It's also interesting how some um, some uh, china or some porcelain, some cups you put in the microwave. I was exactly thinking about this, some cups can get yeah. really hot and some of them exactly. are cold. Yeah, exactly. The reason is the ones that get hot have a fairly high dipole moment. Uh, those that don't, don't have a high di di uh, dipole moment. So that really is exactly how it all works. And just the same way with our, with our circuits, we are mm -hmm. passing it you know, uh, an oscillating, uh, an AC signal through the material. And of course, the higher the frequency, so the, the more we, we oscillate back and forth, the more the, the dipoles move, the more heat we generate. Mm -hmm. So as we go up in frequency, it becomes a much bigger problem for us than at low frequency. And that really is the, the fundamental part of, of why, why this happens. The microwave, by the way, I put it on here, 2.45 gigahertz. Um, there's a number of reasons why it's that frequency. The main one is it's unregulated. Um, originally, um, people say, oh, it's because that's the right frequency for water. No, it's nothing to do with that at all. It's just the fact that you can unreg it's unregulated. You can use the microwave oven anywhere in the world without any regulation issues. Um, but, you know, 2.5 gigahertz is absolutely in the range of where we are with our microwave communications. Well, not microwave, with our, with our communications now. Wi-Fi. <laughs> Wi-Fi, for example, exactly there. Yes, 2.4. Bluetooth. Bluetooth, yeah, precisely. So we're really in this range now. Uh, and it works for water. It works for our substrates. And that's the other thing to think about, too. I mentioned before about water absorption. Uh, so high, highly humid uh, environments for, for certain materials. Of course, if you have water absorbed into your plastic material or your circuit material, the water, of course, will act as a dipole and will cause losses. Mm -hmm. Most materials that you find, uh, I would say probably all the materials that you find designed for low loss actually have a very low uh, water absorption as well. Mm -hmm. Because if you absorb water, you defeat the purpose. You know, mm -hmm. you absorb the water, then you have this, this thing going on. So that really is the next part of the, of the story. And in fact, if I just um, show on here, I talked about a loss factor there. So, you know, you can quantify this, this amount. Um, it, it's, it's, it's dimensionless, so it's just a number basically, but I can show you some examples on here of what that number is, just to give a kind of, um, a, a kind of measure. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's got different names, loss factor, dissipation factor, Dashi loss, loss angle, tan delta. You'll see many people calling it different things. I just call it loss. Mm -hmm. uh, DF, dissipation factor, is, is quite a common one. So air, air is around zero. Um, you know, and vacuum is, is absolutely zero just about when there's nothing there at all. Um, water is pretty bad. I say 0 0.06. Put this in context. Standard FR4 laminate is 0 0.015. Mm -hmm. And that's not good. We know standard FR4 doesn't work well. So we know that's a bad figure. So 0 0.06 uh, is, is what, four times worse. So water is very bad for, uh, for the material. Um, I mentioned before that we're using glass as a reinforcement here. Glass, uh, e-glass is what we normally use, and I'll explain a bit more in a second, uh, has a pretty low loss factor, 0 0.0012, so 10 times better than the overall FR4. So the main problem we have is the epoxy resin. That's the main thing causing us the problem. And when we think about the way we, I mentioned about curing the resin just before, um, this is a, a, a factor which has come into play in the last sort of 20 years or so. When we've moved towards uh, higher reliability uh, for lead-free soldering, which means basically higher temperature soldering, we've had to change the curing system to make the material more survive this process. And in doing so, we've gone to these so-called phenolic cured FR4 types of materials. These are actually worse for loss. So we've cured one problem, which is the, you know, the, the high temperature of soldering. We've made another problem worse. 
So we should always bear this in mind. But then think what we can do to improve this. So I've put the second figure on there, alumina. Alumina is, a, is, a, is an oxide, um, you know, aluminium oxide. And you see this is three zeros too. So very, very low loss. So you can imagine if we add some of this to our FR4 or to other materials, we can actually get the, the, the loss factor down quite a bit. And if you look at modern materials now, I mentioned before, most materials are hybrids. Most materials have several components to them. If we take a low loss substrate and we add filler to it, a ceramic filler like alumina, for example, or other ones, we can get down to a laminate with a 0 0.03 kind of dissipation factor, you know, as opposed to 0 0.015 for standard FR4. That's a pretty big improvement. And if we go towards PTFE, the best material of all, by the way, for reasons I'll explain in a moment, we can get down to 0 0.001, perhaps a bit ambitious, perhaps 0 0.02 we might talk about. So that's the way we mitigate this particular problem um, by, by selecting the right resin, selecting the right kind of uh, glass material, and then also, uh, also using fillers to, um, to absorb or to, also to mitigate some of the, some of the resin properties. Mm -hmm. And that is the, is the trick that's being used now. So basically, this... it's not like a simple material now. It's going to be kind of mixed of all the kind of materials. Exactly. And it really is now. So I mentioned before, there are always two materials or pretty much always two materials in there. There's a kind of reinforcement, which is typically glass. And there's always a binder, a kind of resin, a glue that holds it all together. Now, there's pretty much always a filler as well. Mm -hmm. So One where do you put the filler? Because it, it goes... Can we have a look on the like, typical uh, yeah, let, material? Let, let, let... Let's go back to the, uh, the, the picture here of, the, uh, of the, uh, the raw materials. So where I show resin here, the resin itself now contains not just the pure resin. It oh, contains the, I understand. Okay. It contains the curing system. It also contains fillers. Mm -hmm. So that has, uh, has fillers in there of one kind or another. And they're used for many, many purposes. They're used for, for improving the loss cavities that we just talked about. They're also used because they're also pretty dimensionally stable. So some of the fillers don't expand and contract very much compared to resin. So if you can replace some resin with some fillers, you can reduce the overall expansion of the material, making it more reliable. You can also use fillers that help with flame retardancy. So uh, when we've moved away from, um, or let's say added on another kind of uh, flame retardancy from typically halogens that have been widely used for, for many, many years, um, you often have to add um, fillers which form part of the, the, the flame, the flame uh, retardant system as well. So there's many reasons why you do that. And actually, if you want to sort of follow up on this, uh, if you look in the UL uh, specifications now for materials, we just recently uh, put a whole list of, of definitions for all these materials in there. We talk about these kinds of fillers and, and we talk about what they do. So again, I'm more than happy to explain uh, that in more detail, but that again, is a topic for you know, another whole conversation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> really, really I think cool. important is to know that basically now we mix all the kind of materials together to get uh, different kind of properties. I think I think that's the that's the message really here. So in days gone by, it was fairly straightforward. Now it's not at all straightforward, and we do it at this stage here. We have to do the impregnation stage. So when you get to the stage of the the gluing layer, the the pre preg as we call it layer, already has all the fillers in, has all the curing systems in, has all the frame retardant systems in, ready to be to be bonded later on in the process. So that is the the real um, you know the real the real message at this point. So uh, that's where we do it all. I mentioned PTFE, and I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes just talking I'm, about. I'm curious PTFE. what is. The miracle, Just to explain. Right? <laughs> so you, you probably know PTFE is Teflon. Uh, we normally know it as, which is the trade name uh, from, from DuPont. Uh, Polytetrafluoroethylene. It's a very simple molecule, in fact. I mean, if you look at the, the structure here, it's basically carbons with fluorines either side. Uh, N is, of course, repeat unit. So you get this kind of structure. Here's the carbons, the brown or the, the gray materials, and then the yellows are the, are the fluorine. Um, fluorine is, is, is very uh, electronegative. It's the most reactive of all the, of all the elements, uh, basically. Uh, so, well, certainly all the halogens, let me put it that way. Um, so this actually doesn't want to be anywhere near any other fluorine. So it tries as much as it can to, to move itself away from, from, from adjacent fluorines. So what you end up with is this kind of, a kind of cylindrical back, back, backbone where all the fluorine atoms try to move away from the rest and you form a kind of really rigid uh, kind, of, um, kind of chain, very, very strong indeed, uh, and, and fixed in position. And what that means is when you pass a current near this, you want to try and make it vibrate because of, we mentioned before, dipole moment. There's hardly any dipole moment at all. So it doesn't vibrate at all because it's totally fixed in position. Because it doesn't vibrate, of course, it doesn't, it doesn't absorb energy. So it has a very, very low loss. 
and that's the trick um, of, of PTFE basically. Um, we can talk about the uh, you know the, um, uh, the the reaction drive uh, for for this, um, but this is again is a, is a matter of thermodynamics, and we probably don't want to go to go there. But you may wonder why I've drawn a picture of a of a gecko on the on the slide here. Uh, the reason is that you know basically geckos can stick to anything. They can climb up walls. They can go upside down on your ceiling. They can't stick to PTFE. PTFE surface is so low energy they absolutely cannot stick to it. And there are on YouTube some little videos of people putting geckos into Teflon uh, uh, pans and, and, and they get really confused because they can't get out. You know, they're really, really uh, struggling to, to get around. So PTFE is a very, very special material uh, and it is being used very widely now, many, many times in antennas, but other things as well. Um, of course, it does bring its problems because uh, PTFE, uh, because of this, um, this uh, very special uh, condition, is very hard to process. It's very hard to get uh, surface, uh, surface adhesion onto the surface of copper or conductors, for example. It's also hard to make these into multiple layers. So there are, there are ways of, of doing that. And the PTFE doesn't really, doesn't really flow either. It doesn't really melt. It, it, it becomes very, very viscous. Uh, you have to actually sort of sinter this material rather than, than process it. So, you know, again, there's no, there's no free lunch here either. You know, there are problems, but PTFE does offer really unique uh, properties. And it's the best we have currently. Um, unfortunately, there are some moves to, uh, to restrict the use of PTFE through the, uh, the EU's REACH program. Um, you know, again, um, we'll see where we go with that. There, there's a discussion occurring right now in producing PTFE. There are some, there are some chemicals that um, are persistent uh, pollutants, um, which you know, can enter the, the food chain, enter our environment. So there are some concerns there. Uh, and we may see some, some restrictions on some kinds of, of PTFE mm -hmm. or, or some parts of this um, of this this chain. We'll see. I mean, we're, we're in discussion right now uh, to try to um, try to understand uh, what the reason is is behind uh, trying to bring in um, uh, controls. But you know, let's not worry about that right now. That's another another story. This is um, interesting because uh, when you mentioned this, uh, it's hard to process. Uh, I some time ago I heard that one of the biggest problems with these uh, low uh, loss materials is exactly. Uh, they don't want to uh, stick uh, very yeah. well together they may peel off or you know exactly. so the reason is because uh, because of the structure of the material is basically preventing all this uh, stickness yes okay. yes it, it, it has if you like a, a very low surface energy and it's very hard to bond to it i mean if you think about epoxy epoxy resins that we normally use Epoxy is a wonderful glue. You know, we use it. We use araldite. I've used it for years. We use epoxy resins to bond all kinds of things together. So we know epoxy sticks very, very well. So epoxy is a wonderful material, and it, and it survived for a great many years in our industry because it is so versatile and so easy to use. And we can stick the copper and the layers together very, very easy with epoxy. PTFE, not so. PTFE is very, very difficult to stick. While we use it for our non-stick frying pans, you know, that's the coating we mm -hmm. have on them. That's why our, you know, our food that we prepare doesn't stick to the pan. Um, so um, the same issue, we try and stick copper to there, it's quite difficult. So you have to sometimes apply adhesives, you have to do sometimes some surface uh, topography, uh, some, some uh, um, say some shaping of the surface to make uh, things stick, or you have to apply uh, coatings and, and materials to the copper foil to make it stick. So that is a concern. Uh, it's doable uh, and we can manage that. Uh, but when it comes to very, very complex multi-layer circuitry, it's quite hard. So what you often see, and I'll take an example here of a, um, uh, let's say, an automotive radar sensor for, uh, for distance control or for, uh, say, uh, um, you know, um, um, looking for, for potential collisions ahead or, you know, um, um, adaptive speed control, let's say, adaptive cruise control. You have, um, of course, an antenna, you have a radar signal, which you have to actually pass back and forth. And then you have some processing. So what you see quite often is you'll see the front of these uh, these devices, these these sensors are made with PTFE mm -hmm. with with uh, uh, antenna elements. And then the back of the board has bonded on the back uh, an FR4 or something like that. Um, which is used for signal processing. So we have many of these hybrid boards now where the only the layer that needs to be low loss is low loss and all the rest is standard material. Yeah, this is exactly what I actually heard that uh, sometimes if you would like to, if you need expensive material, uh, then one of the option is use it only on selected, selected layers and make rest of the stack up from standard materials. 
Exactly. And that's precisely what happens now. So you'll see quite often in big designs, especially in, you know, in, uh, in switch companies, uh, guys, you know, guys in, uh, making network switches and so on, you will find one or two layers in there, perhaps 40 layer stack up might be very low loss material. They might be PTFE, they might be uh, other kinds of materials, PPO, for example. Um, and there'll be just those layers where they need it. You don't have to make the whole board that way. And again, this is a, this is smart. You know, this is the, this is using a smart, uh, smart, smart ideas. Um, because you know you, you you mitigate the cost to the one the one the one hand, and secondly, not just the cost of the materials, the cost of processing, the cost of process PTFE, it, it can be much higher because mm -hmm. you have it's very difficult. You can't even drill it very easily. Um, it's very hard to, to process in many many ways. So only use it where you have to use it and where it's necessary. Other parts let you stand the materials. Does of course, it need you... to be symmetrical then the stack up? Um, okay, not not necessarily. Uh, I would say uh, preferably yes, and I've always I've always preached they should be preferably symmetrical. And most designs that you'll see will have symmetry where where it can be achieved. But if you have only one small thin layer of let's say a low loss material in the stack of a forty or fifty or sixty layers, it doesn't make any difference. Oh, okay, it's so tiny. it's not going to bend or something. No. Okay, okay. In extreme cases, yes. If you put let's say half the board on top made of PTFE, half the board on the bottom made of uh, made of epoxy FR4, for example, both these materials have different coefficients of expansion. So when you heat the board up, they will, it will you know, curve one way or the other, absolutely. Uh, but we're not doing that. We're just putting one very small layer and the bulk of the material can, can, uh, you know, can, can use its properties to overcome the small, the small layer, which has a different, uh, a different expansion coefficient. So yeah, it is a concern, absolutely. But, uh, but that again can be, can be managed. And you will see a lot of these uh, these network guys do that right now. We're doing it for many years, actually, having single layers um, of a, of a low loss material. You know, for, for for that very reason, you know, to make it um, um, say to make it more cost effective, or only using this low loss where they have to to make the processing easier during the rest of the uh, the PCB manufacturing stage. Okay. So, yeah, do, do you have something else about losses? I'm sorry for interrupting you. No, uh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> I, I, you have so many things to tell about the one of topics and I would like to cover more topics so I keep interrupting you. No, no, not at all. So let's let's talk about losses here. Let's talk about um okay I, I want to talk a little bit about about the um about the structure of the material. Okay. This, is, this is quite interesting as well. I mentioned glass fabric before. Most materials we use use glass fabric. Let me just go back a little bit um, to this slide here. So when we use glass fabric, uh, there are different what's called styles, different thicknesses, if you like, of glass fabric. We use this as a, re as a reinforcement. They're there to give mechanical stability to the circuit board. Nearly all circuit boards have them. Uh, not the ones used in mobile phones, by the way. These are a different technology completely, but most I of the ones that we see. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the, these again use so-called build-up technologies. Um, uh, there are some uh, some some uh, reinforcements in there, but many of the layers are not. Uh, but typical PCBs use glass fabric with epoxy resin. And just I just draw your attention to uh, to the first. Oh, let me just go up even one more. So when you say glass fabric, does it mean is it really from glass, or what does it yes, mean? Yes, absolutely glass. Absolutely glass. Uh, it's made of very very thin filaments of glass. These filaments are between five and nine microns in diameter, tiny filaments of glass. Um, human hairs, if I had any, I, I don't anymore, but when I had human hairs, um, these are around, let's say, 100 microns. So we're talking about, you know, a tenth or a twentieth of the thickness of a human hair. Very, very, very fine filaments. And of course, when you go to very fine filaments, you end up with an entirely different set of mechanical properties than you do with the bulk material. So, for example, you can bend these. They're flexible. Um, you can, I, I don't have any on my desk right now, but I could, I could show you some. Um, so um, they, they, they're very, very strong in tension. So when you try and pull them apart, that they, they, they don't fail. In compression, they, they, they can fail. So we use these in tension typically, and we weave these little, little fine filaments into what's called yarns. So we take lots and lots and lots of these tiny filaments and we put it into a yarn, into a kind of thread. And if you look at these, these here, for example, let me just show this one here, this 106 example. This here is made of hundreds of little tiny filaments of glass fabric mm -hmm. going this way and going this way. Um, there is a reason uh, why there are two directions here. Um, one is called the warp direction, one is called the weft. Uh, and that's to do with the weaving process. Again, uh, probably a topic for another day, not, not to be bundled in today. What I want to show here is, this is the glass, these dark bits. These bits in between are spaces between the glass. These get filled with resin, of course, mm -hmm. when we use the resin impregnation process. And some glass has a lot of air spaces. Some glass has less air spaces. Mm -hmm. 
there is a problem when we come to this. So let me just show you this picture, which is courtesy of my, my good friends at Polar Instruments. This is looking now at a, a typical uh, laminate. So just to put context to this, these little things here, these little little circles you can see, are the ends of the glass fibres mm -hmm. coming towards you. So they're going into the screen. And you can see how many there are. There are hundreds and hundreds of these in this in this thread. Mm -hmm. This is a, a flattened thread. These here, going this way, are the fibres going going uh, in the plane of the screen. Yeah. Uh, so obviously that you know they're, they're not all con continuous because they're, they're they're sort of twisted together. So that's what we can see. So you see here uh, a fairly thick bundle of fibres. And here, a fairly thin bundle of fibres. Can you see this is yeah. far smaller fibres? It's a different style of glass. So a thinner style of glass and a thicker style of glass. The problem we face is, is this. If I look at this, this micro DK effect, this is dielectric constant, which, which of course is very important for, uh, for transmission speed. It is the measure best of how much charge can be stored uh, within, within a system. Yeah, it's, what, so, it's important, it's used to calculate impedance. Exactly, yeah. and that, and also impedance, and also for the transmission speed, uh, which again comes into signal integrity, which I will I will touch again in a moment. So, if you imagine having a uh, fiber, uh, sorry, a copper conductor here, a conductor here, so a, a matched pair, a, a, a twin, you know, twin um, um, differential uh, pair, differential pair exactly against a reference plane, which is here. So, have a look at the have a look at the properties of this. I've just taken a cross section here. Between this, this, this uh, part of the differential pair and the reference plane here, we're seeing mainly glass. Glass fiber has a dielectric constant of around 6.6, .6, more or less. Look at the other part of the, of the match pair or the, 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 um, um, the twin. Here you see mainly resin. There's not much glass in this space. Resin's got a DK of around 3.5. So nearly half that of glass fiber. So quite a big difference in the diff in the dietary constant between this mainly glass and mainly resin part. So when you send a differential signal down down these two, it has a different speed, mm -hmm. and that's the problem. Here's the velocity factor. You know the, the transmission line velocity factor. You can just calculate this very simply. Er is the dk. So if we take electric transmission around two hundred seventy thousand kilometers per second, if you take the velocity factor over glass, which means this bit here. We're talking about 105 kilometers per second for the signal. Take the resin part here. We're talking 144 kilograms, uh, sorry, uh, kil kilometers per second. So that's a pretty big difference, you know, almost a third, almost a third faster. So if you've got a differential pair and you're sending a signal down between those two, those two traces. Yeah, the difference not... between edges will start. Exactly. Changing. It doesn't arrive at the end at the same time anymore. It actually arrives uh, sooner or later. And that damages the signal integrity. Of course, the the whole principle of a differential pair is you get you get you get noise immunity because basically you've got you know the plus, plus and the minus side. So any 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 noise that comes onto the signal is basically eliminated uh, be, between these this positive and, and negative part. You don't get that anymore because now we lose our integrity, uh, and the and the nice beautiful eye that we see normally becomes completely skewed, and you actually in the end in the end lose all of the signal. So um, that is a very important consideration. And I, sh I showed some examples of the glass fabrics, you know, just to show the different styles and the different gaps you get in them. Um, and there's a very nice little no, bit of work. Let's go back, let's go back, because Sorry, so basically back. it means for uh, high speed designs, we would like to use, for example, 1086 rather well, than 1. Yes. Uh, they do, and th these are the. Um, so you may not have a choice in terms of the thickness you can use. So sometimes uh, these are traditional styles. This 1080 or 1080 uh, has around, um, let's say, it's around, um, let's say, 65 to 80 microns in, in thickness. So you, you get a measure for how thick that is. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's very open. So uh, what's been developed in the last years, recent years, is what's called square weave uh, styles of glass fabric. So the square weave is basically, instead of having different thread counts one way and the other, um, uh, we actually manipulate the, the, the construction uh, to end up with, with more, more or less the same both ways. Mm -hmm. And we actually span these bundles a bit. So rather than being very, very tight little sort of ropes, they're now sort of flat bundles and they spread out a bit more. So that gap there, which was ba basically mainly resin, is now much, much smaller. Mm -hmm. So when you see low loss and high, high speed designs in particular, you will find people moving from the 1080 to the 1086 for this, uh, this square weave fabric. The same occurs uh, on the thinner materials. 106 is a pretty thin material. Uh, you can go thinner as well, but 106 is the, is the sort of standard uh, uh, thinner material that people would use, around 50 microns, more or less, so, so two mils. 
um, in thickness. That's the standard, which is very, very open. So this is giving us huge problems when it comes to this, uh, this, this effect. Because the problem is you don't know where the trace falls, of course. Mm -hmm. The trace may fall here, it may fall here, it may fall here. You don't know. So you can't design this out. You know, oh, sure sometimes what... people are out, or sometimes people, they rotate the designs. Yeah. So it just goes like diagonally or what is it? Yes, and, and, and that is a good technique for mitigating the problem. So you end up just, just angling this around by 15, 20 degrees, whatever. So in the end, both parts of the differential pair see the same basic uh, uh, image. The problem with that, of course, is you're, you're having yield losses. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and also there can be some, some influences when you don't have the weave square with the panel. There can be some dimensional stability issues as well. The material can move around in unexpected ways with, with temperature cycling. So it is a solution, but not, not a perfect solution. Um, going to this, though, um, can probably mitigate it for you. So going from these big gaps to these smaller gaps is a very good idea. And you'll find most people designing into that space now will specify the so-called square weave uh, styles. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that is a very, a very important development in recent years. So you can use a low loss resin. Uh, you can then use square weave styles. And we come to copper in a moment. We haven't talked about copper at all yet. <laughs> <laughs> So it goes even deeper. But the, the, the great bit of work I wanted to show you was this work done by Lee Ritchie a little while ago. Um, Lee Ritchie um, um, is, is a guy who's been lecturing on this for many years. I've met him several times and assisted in some of his presentations. Um, so he was looking at uh, impedance. He's measuring just impedance. And impedance is basically the, the resistance, electrical resistance, uh, plus the, the reactive uh, inductance. So if you like, the DC resistance and the and the AC resistance. Let me put it put it that kind of way. The inductance is the is the uh, the force uh, opposing passing uh, passing uh, alternating currents through through conductors. So there is a calculation. This is it. Uh, not that it really matters. But if there's an impedance mismatch, of course we get problems. So impedance I, is I a like the picture. Good, this is a good picture. Yes, <laughs> everything's spraying out. So so um, it's quite important to actually match the impedance where we can. Um, if we don't match impedance, we get we get this kind of terrible, uh, you know, terrible uh, uh, loss situation. So all Lee did was very, very simply, he took a wire, just a copper wire, and he just laid it over some glass fabric. This is the so-called 1080 style I mentioned before. He then had a look um, at what the impedance change was like over the length. So he used the TDR just to measure the impedance changes. And you can see the ups and downs in impedance along the length of that of that of that conductor, you know, very, very markedly as it passes over you know, areas of, of resin rich, or let's say in this case, air, there's no resin here, just the glass, um, you know, quite plain to see. He then used this style of 3313 glass cloth instead, which as you can see is far more dense. So we don't have any air gaps, basically. Let the conductor across and look at the TDR trace now. So what are the different, uh, I see there is a red one, blue one, green one. What are the differences? Yeah, I think these are the different, um, uh, let me just see what it says. He's using, um, different probes i think in this case yes the different probes i think he's saying so um um they're all pretty much the same i think what he's just trying to demonstrate in this case using even even yeah even even different different measurement techniques and methods it's still flat and that's the point you don't get these ups and downs mm -hmm. as you do here so what he's saying just his quote which i I've, I've quoted many many times it's from 2007 in fact so it's quite a long time ago it doesn't change though the reality is still there by simply changing the style of glass used in the laminate the problems of varying impedance and velocity have been substantially re reduced. So, you know, that in itself is the is, is the message here. We've made a massive difference to our um, uh, to our problems of, of mismatch of impedance and velocity changes. You know, velocity is really a, is really a killer when it comes to uh, to these materials. So that's the kind of um, kind of thing we can see. So um, hopefully I've explained a bit. About that. There, there is, of course, um, the overall uh, differential, uh, sorry, uh, um, dissipation um, factor, and also the the dietary constant of the material. Yeah, you know, I've mentioned that you know glass is has got a decay of around six point six, and resin about three point five ish. Of course, the actual overall um, uh, dietary constant will be a mixture of those two parameters, and there is a kind of a chart to show where that is. And again, I mention this because it's quite important that people don't believe that materials have a single value. They don't. It depends on the style of glass and the thickness you're using. So I just mentioned those numbers here. E-glass, I've talked about E-glass, I can talk about other glasses as well, but let's talk about E-glass, the most commonly used glass, 6.6 .6 at one megahertz. Forget the one megahertz, it doesn't really matter, but you know, it has a, um, a value almost twice as high as the epoxy resin. 
3.5. If you take a laminate, it depends on how much resin you have and how much glass you have. A standard uh, FR4 material will have around 40 to 45 percent of, of resin, the rest being glass. And the dietary constant you can see is around four point something. Uh, different frequencies, different values. You know, that's, that, that is the reality. But as you increase the resin, you reduce the dietary constant up, down and down and down and down. Um, interestingly, when you go to thinner materials, the percentage of resin increases. So we're losing more and more resin, which actually is quite a good thing from the point of view of the dietary constant, because we reduce the dietary constant as we get higher levels. And we're talking there, typical low loss designs, fairly complex circuitry now, between 60, 70, even 75% resin content, which is the positive side. The negative side is that um, when it comes to loss, it's the other way around completely. So the losses are really in the resin, not in the glass. So the more resin you add, the more the losses mm -hmm. add up. Dissipation factor gets worse. So again, there's, there's no free lunch. Uh, we, we get one property improving and one property going the other way. Um, so that, that is the, the, way of, uh, the way of things. Uh, and I just wanted to show this chart to explain uh, what we can do in terms of, in terms of, uh, of the glass. So I mentioned e-glass. E is electrical glass. It's what we mainly use for everything. It's the most widely available glass. There was a glass called D-glass so for dielectric some, some years ago, although you really hardly see it now. There's a thing now called NE glass produced by a Japanese producer, which actually does improve things a bit. So from the 6.6 DK of glass, uh, which is pretty high, we can get down to four point something now. So we can mitigate a bit this DK property on the glass and actually it improves the dissipation factor as well. Not that we're worried about that, really. You know, this is actually quite a nice value for E glass, but we can get even better with the NE mm -hmm. glass. So so there are ways and the formulation just determines how we do this. You know, there's Glass is composed of, of oxides, mainly silicon. That's what we used to with, uh, you know, sand from the beach. Uh, but we also add other other elements mm -hmm. in uh, for different reasons. You know, um, boron to make borosilicate glass, for example, which is what this is largely we're talking about. Again, we used used to use that in in chemical wear. It, of course, different glasses have different chemical um, de chemical um, uh, resiliences as well. That doesn't really affect us for for our industry. Uh, we're mainly concerned with electrical properties. So you can do something with the the glass fiber to make things a bit better from this uh, from this DK point of view. So you know there are some mitigations possible. But I think the main thing that people should take away is look at the style of glass. I think that's the number one thing. If you can change the style of glass to these spread fibers, this more more dense glass fibers, you will immediately improve the the signal integrity uh, of the material. So. That's a kind of talk through the, um, uh, you know, the various um, bits that, that, that do with the resin. I mean, I can talk about uh, the influence um, of the... Um, copper. We didn't talk about the copper. Well, let's come to copper now because we should do. Copper is quite an important point here. So let me let me come exactly to that because we, we've talked about glass and the resin. So the copper has a huge influence as well for a number of reasons. Um, the problem mainly is the skin effect, um, which we've we've heard about probably many times by now, and I've been talking about this for a great many years. And it's basically the tendency of the, the current flow to the outside of a conductor at high frequencies. You know, it's a kind of eddy current effect, if you like. So if you look at this, this image here, you see that the current density increases towards the outside of the conductor, depending on frequency. There's an equation uh, which you can which you can pick up for this. And I just put numbers into the equation. So 50 hertz. The skin depth is nine millimeters. Bearing in mind, most of our copper conductors are, let's say, between five and thirty-five microns, just to give a give a value for the thickness. So um, when we get to ten megahertz, we're in the kind of range where we're using our, our thickness of copper now. Hundred megahertz, we're right in the range. At ten gigahertz, we're absolutely in the very outside of the skin of our copper foil. So you know, copper foil, the thinnest we typically use would be five microns, let's say. And all the all the current is flowing in the 0.66 microns on the very outside of it. Yeah, I would like to I would like to point out this because I mm. still see some people uh, asking questions. For example, when we have signal or track, and then we have a ground plane. For example, they are asking if the currents will be also on the other side of the ground plane for very mm. high speed signals. No, because most of the currents it only flows in very it doesn't go very deep into the industry. Exactly. And of course, when you have a ground plane, you have a reference to the ground plane, which is a track, as, I, as we showed before, the differential pair. So it's that gap between those two where the where the current is flowing, basically. So uh, you see it on that side. Of course, it is a bit different with the ground plane and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a copper foil trace. 
because the topography is different depending on the side of the copper you are. And again, I, I'll show you a picture of that just so you can see what I'm talking about here. This is an example oops, of what copper foil looks like. So um, when copper foil is made, it's done on, on a, it's electrodeposited on, onto a drum, a very, very smooth, highly polished drum. So we get a very smooth surface on one side of the copper. These are the dendrites that grow, basically. The copper is growing in a, in a dendritic fashion, which is very advantageous, by the way, for, for etching uh, because of the, uh, the way the, um, the etchants work and the, and the high energy at the grain boundaries. So this is, this is the good way to do it. But of course, on the other side, we end up with a fairly rough surface, which is the side that's in the solution as we're producing the copper foil. Um, and that's a good thing for us because we want to have a fairly rough side so we can bond into the resin and make a good bond. We talked about before about, um, you know, PTFE not being very good at, at bonding the foil. If you have a good, let's say, mechanical bond, that can work. And then we do it, we go even further. We put these little tiny nodules on the back of these peaks to make a really, really high surface area structure. So these are electromicrographs of so what this looks like. This is the drum side, so the shiny side which would be the side of the ground plane, by the way, that the, the, the conductor would see, the, 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 uh, you know, the reference uh, conductor would see. Oops, sorry about that. Um, this is the bonding side, so the very rough side, the very high surface area side, which as you can see is very rough indeed. That's this side. And that's how we do it typically. And if you imagine this whole thickness here, in this case is probably 35 microns, about a third of the thickness is actually underneath the surface of the laminate. It's embedded in the laminate. So a third of the thickness is actually what we call treatment mm -hmm. or the side. So again, people don't realize this either. Um, so what's the consequence of this? It, it's quite major. Um, and if we, I'll just skip that. I'll just come to this slide here. So if we take uh, a 10 megahertz frequency, so a pretty modest frequency, actually, um, 21 microns uh, is the skin depth. So what happens is the signal path is through, the, through the, the bulk of the material. So it doesn't need to travel in the outside because it has a 21 micron skin depth. The whole thing is only 35 or 17, 17 microns. So it can use the entire width or the entire uh, copper bulk as its path for signal. Step up though to 100 megahertz, again, not a very high frequency. The skin depth is now 6.6 .6 microns. So on the surface, it's fine. You know, it runs across here in a beautiful straight line, no problem. But on the other side, of course, this treatment depth is probably in the range of, of 10 microns already. So the skin depth of six microns falls exactly into this treatment area. So the problem is we end up with a longer signal path up and down, up and down, up and down. It can't flow through here because of the skin. It has to flow in the skin. So you get this longer path and you also get a uh, higher resistance because you have different materials in here. So it's not pure copper in here. We also have some other metals. Uh, which are used as a kind of barrier layer in the outside. So it's a really serious problem when we get to this to this point uh, of, of of running the signal through this through this skin. Even at 100 megahertz, it begins to have an impact. And you know, um, when I showed you those original charts that we started with, let's go back to those again. Those original pictures. I mentioned here zero dielectric loss. So no loss from the copper. Sorry, no loss from the resin. No loss from the glass. Just from the copper. Mm -hmm get this immediately just from that skin effect on mm -hmm. the, the on the copper. So it's a very major effect. And actually, uh, I'll put it very simply, if you don't take care of the copper and the profile on the copper, you can forget about the uh, about the, uh, you know, the, the resin of the glass. It doesn't actually matter. You lose all the signal just in the copper before you've even looked at the low loss material. So it's a, it's a major point. And when you look at what's available in the market or what's available to uh, to to consumers or to um, um, you know, designers of circuit boards, we have a so-called standard copper foil with a 10 micron tooth, 10 micron, which is massive uh, standard so-called HT high temperature elongation foil, 10 microns. Low profile goes from five to 9.9 .9 microns. It's really no better, you know, it doesn't really help us at that kind of level. Very low profile in specification so far is defined as, as uh, less than five microns. Uh, but I can tell you even five microns is a problem for us. So what you're seeing now is uh, copper foil profiles of what's called ANP, almost no profile. <laughs> <laughs> That's the latest kind of kind of term uh, or EVLP, very low profile. So extremely very low profile or um, all different terms that you'll find on there um, where we're getting down to, you know, to, to micron levels now of, of treatment. But of course, the downside is when you haven't got this mechanical bond there. You can't you, stick it. <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. So we have to use other techniques for that. So having to use organic uh, uh, materials to actually help to bond the copper foil on there. There are some ways, some ways around this. Um, so uh, I haven't actually put this into the, I haven't got the slide to show this, but I'll, I'll explain to you a, a material called reverse treated foil. So can you imagine, instead of making the foil this way, we take these little tiny nodules, we put them on the top instead. Little tiny nodules on the top, and we just keep this fairly minor tooth on the bottom. This so-called RTF, or reverse treated foil, uh, can actually give us some mitigation straight away. And you'll see in the USA, it's been used for many years um, as a, um, first of all, as, as, a, as a way of getting finer traces uh, onto, onto the boards uh, and, and squarer, uh, squarer side traces for, um, or, or size to our etched copper, copper uh, layers. But actually, it does help with the, the low loss as well. Um, I don't think it's the whole solution, but it's certainly a part way to go towards that. We we have to really do is actually work on these very low profile foils and start to get these ultra low profile uh, or almost no profile uh, treatments on the foil. So as a designer, you must consider that as well, and that is also in the design tools. You'll find the the foil kind foil types in the design tools that designers are using, so you can select the kind of foil. Can you mention a a, a tool what uh, is useful and includes all these kind of materials? Yeah, um, you know, if you go polar, to Sam, I think Polar maybe. In yes, I, I, I mentioned Polar Instruments before. And you mentioned Altium also. I, I did also, yes. And, and Altium takes data from all the all the producers, as does Polar. Uh, I work with Polar quite a lot, and we, we've done a lot of work with them over the years. So Martin Gaudian has developed, you know, uh, some of these tools. So actually, if you look at their their tools, they, they've got some nice presentations, by the way, on, on their sort of uh, Hooray Snowball model, which is basically what, how, how they model the influence of the profile. So actually, um, you know, Polo has gone from a company which used to do testing largely, so they would actually test impedance on boards, to actually still doing that, of course, but now modelling it far more. So they're very, very good at giving you a kind of model um, that can predict the performance for the designer. So yes, I would, I would certainly suggest having a look at the Polar Instruments tools, and they do model the all the foils that are available now, including the uh, the almost no profile foils. So I think that's what we have to consider. If you don't consider this, you know, as a designer, you may make a wonderful design, you may select the fantastic material to use for your product, but actually it doesn't work because the foil has taken your entire lost budget just because it has this uh, has this profile on there. So yes, certainly look at, look towards Polar for this. And again, there's some great presentations that that, yeah. uh, that were produced to help with this. And, and I, I would think... like to mention, I have done some videos with Bert Simonovic, and he's talking about this a lot. Right. Okay. Again, um, people should watch those those videos and actually learn from them because I think as a designer, you need to understand all these three elements. You know, the glass, uh, the copper, uh, and the resin. And also the fillers, by the way, I mentioned before, so perhaps four elements. And if you don't take consideration of all of these, you may end up, you know, quite easily um, uh, having your design not work. And that, that really is, is quite a significant risk here. So, yeah, uh, yeah, please, uh, I, I certainly recommend people would look at those videos as well and learn what they can. I think designers, I've been talking to designers for, for a great many years now, and, and, I, and I love talking to designers um, because... Uh, the design community is very large, of course, and the design community covers all applications from consumer to, you know, to high end, high reliability um, uh, space and, and, and um, uh, military applications. But they have the same issues as everybody together. So even different, different uh, arenas or different application areas, they have the same kind of issues. And I think the more they can listen to people and more listen to your, your podcasts about these kinds of things, the better their, their work will be and the more they'll get it right uh, first time. Yeah, but I don't want to scare uh, many people because no, no. then uh, I, I see uh, sometimes on forum or on our Discord, they are like, uh, I'm designing a, I don't know, microcontroller board. To, uh, what kind of materials I have to use? And I'm like, mm, okay, maybe you don't really need to worry about this kind of... Uh... No, and actually, you know, the, the, the first port of call here when you're wondering about that is as a designer, um, talk to the board shop and say, look, I'm making this kind of design, you know, can you help me here? And the board shop will often do that because they'll have seen similar designs from, from other companies in the similar kind of space and they'll probably help you to do that. Or talk to the material supplier, you know, talk to Ventec uh, or, you know, pick up the phone. We're always happy to discuss uh, the design and, and, and recommend the kind of material that would work. You know, and I think it's a pity that our standards don't really help us do that very much at the moment, but we are working on that. And I think we will come to this as you mentioned right at the beginning, you know, this kind of uh, uh, application specific areas, you know, where we will come with a set of materials. Say, okay, if you're in this space, mm -hmm. have a look at these materials, mm -hmm. 
we do it for a number of a number of materials now, and I think I think that really is a is a help for designers. You know, we would have a you know a space for aero, a space for a space for auto, a, space, a particular set of materials for for defence and space. And I think you know that's quite nice to bring the materials together and actually curate them into into sets for the designer. And the more we can talk to designers, the better actually, because you know um, it will make their uh, make our life easier and their life easier as well, uh, because they will have a you know a basic set of materials to go to. So um, you work in Ventec. So what do what do you yes. do? You do you create these kind of materials. Can you go to first slide? I think there is also your contact if someone would like to contact you maybe. Yes, let's do that. Um, so I, I'm a technology ambassador for Ventec. Uh, basically, I, I help people with the technologies that, it, that, that, that Ventec employs and I help to promote the technologies that Ventec employs as well. You know, Ventec is a producer that has a very broad product range. Um, many, many specialty products. So I mentioned the IMS before where, again, we have a, a lot of products and we mentioned the polyamide, again, where we have a uh, a very uh, a very large um, uh, presence on all three continents for that um, for that kind of technology. Uh, but actually, as a producer, we're, we're very broad. So there's a lot of new materials coming all the time. And that's what I like to do, frankly. So uh, we're looking at, um, you know, more and more high speed materials and, and thermally conducted materials are the two two areas I'm working in right now with, with Ventec. So, yeah, please, uh, you know, you can send me an email. I'm more than happy to help. We have application engineers as well that can help um, help designers. So you can well, help also select a PCB manufacturer because uh, yes. not every PCB manufacturer can actually, or they not many of them work with all the kind of different materials because I believe yes. always when they would like to use new materials, there should be some kind of testing. They can't really just buy a new material which they have never used before and then just make PCBs from this. Absolutely correct. And, uh, you know, that, that is a hugely important part of, of all this discussion and especially on low loss. So we talked about the copper foil profile just a few minutes ago about the almost no profile, and how we're working very heavily to actually improve the profile of the copper foil as we bond to the material. Of course, the other side is also treated by the board shop. They make a roughening as well of this material to actually bond it into their multi-layer stacks. So can you imagine we do all our work, we produce a wonderful uh, almost no profile film on the one side. They take it then and they make it like the, the surface of the moon because they want to bond it. And of course, they can then take away all of the benefits that we've done because they don't understand it. Um, many board shops do understand it very, very well. So if you're going to produce a board um, for, for low loss high frequency, my advice would be to find a specialist producer. And there are many of them who know what they're doing and can show you uh, how they're in control of their process. If you don't do that, uh, you can end up, you know, again, losing the, uh, the, whole, the whole story on the loss. So, yes, absolutely. And we can help you with that. We can tell you which producers we're working with and are used to using, not just ours, but of course, other materials too. We're not the only producer in the market, not, not, not by a, a long measure. Uh, but of course... Can we, we mention can... just someone, uh, like one in the US, or let's say one in Europe or something? Well, we can look in Europe. There's, there's a whole cluster actually in, uh, in Europe, um, in Switzerland, for example. We can look at OptiPrint, VariaPrint are two, mm -hmm. two very specialist producers. But there are, there are a great many producers who, um, who, really, uh, who really do this kind of technology. In I mean, the US? Do you know some in the US? Um, yeah, I, I, I could probably think of some. Well, TTM would be one I would think of straight okay. away. You know, TTM is present in, in, the, in the whole of the world. Um, I, um, I don't want to make like advertisement, but I right. think people may be wondering like, Okay, what would, who are these manufacturers? So I think this is just some kind of starting point. Let's, you know, have a look at these companies. And you can think of you know, people other. like Amphenol, Amphenol Infotech is another good one in, 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 in Europe. You know, there are, there are many of them, Somatius or the, um, in Asia, DSG group, uh, Graphics. So many people who are specialists in this area. But again, if people want to have some, some real detailed knowledge, then ask. I mean, we, okay. we can, of course. We can, of course, help with that, as can most of the people. But the other thing I wanted to show was just on the, the capability. Yeah, yeah. let's have um, a look. What do you have? What um, else do you have here? This is quite an interesting little little one to put out as well. So um, tolerances are also very important. So when we come down to thinking about these low loss materials, and especially for 5G, this is some data from from uh, from Ericsson, actually, who uh, we worked a lot with. So when you're looking at, at typical tolerances for standard materials, you know, let's say even up to 4G, plus or minus 30 microns in line width, Thickness plus or minus 10%. Registration layer to layer, 150 microns. Impedance plus or minus 10%. When you go to 5G requirements, they wanted to basically halve all of these or mainly halve them. And that's a pretty big challenge. You know, going from 30 microns to 12 and a half microns. Thickness plus or minus 5%. 
100 micron registration and an impedance by 5%. So when we get these new requirements for uh, for high frequency, which, which 5G brought, by the way, we have to more or less half the uh, the tolerances of the PCB board shop in what they're producing and the materials that we produce as well. Of course, 6G is now being worked on, so, you know, this doesn't stop. <laughs> and also high band 5G is now is now being rolled out as well, so 24 gigahertz and above. So there will be another column here at some stage, which is going to be even worse. So, you know, the requirement on the, on the, the um, let's say, the, um, the tolerances put onto the board shop and material suppliers only get worse and worse as time goes on. So I think that is a pretty important, uh, important step. And it does take me to, to the, probably the last bit I want to talk about. I'm not sure how we're doing for time, but um, mm. we're okay. We still, we still uh, have time. I just would like to go back to the table. So what sorry. is the registration? Layer, so registr layer registration. When you have a let's say a multi-layer circuit board, so we have different layers. You know, I, I, in fact, we can we can just look at some layers by by the picture I showed just before. I understand all the other line width. Everyone knows what is line so, width. Uh, here's some layers. So these are different layers here. This is um, this is a layer. This is a copper conductor. These are layers. These are layers here. So inside here, you see different layers. In this particular case, uh, there is one material here. This is one layer. Mm -hmm. uh, this is another layer. And another layer and another layer. So this is probably um if I add them up. So oops. Um so let's come back to this. If I look at these here, uh, just go back and I, I move the image. So yeah, um, I would like to point out, for example, when uh PCB stack up is built, uh, there may be, for example, multiple prepregs on top of each other to achieve the right. correct uh the electricum thickness. That's what we are talking about. You can have three different it's exactly. materials. I mean, here you can see the copper layers straight away. There's one, two, three, four, five. There are six copper layers here. This board is at least a six layer, a six layer multi layer board with these different these different conductors in there. When I talk about registration layer to layer. I'm talking about how this layer lines up with this layer and this layer. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. It's a ground plane. This layer here does matter with this layer here as well. So this layer and this layer have to be aligned. Mm -hmm. to some so if degree. it's offset between different layers yes exactly so so if they're offset if this layer is moved over here for some reason you will get um you know a, a difference uh, in the performance and especially matters when you put a, a hole through here so this hasn't got any holes in we haven't drilled any holes to make connections we could put a, a, a microvire or a hole right the way through this entire board and we may actually miss one of these conductors if the if this layer is if moved mm -hmm. across the line mm -hmm. by even even say two two mils or so we may drill a hole and we may miss the layer completely. Mm -hmm. So when we, when we play through here to try and connect, we miss the connection and we don't have a connection. So the board fails. So that's what I mean by layer to layer, layer to layer registration. The layers must line up. They've got to be in, in a reasonable, a reasonably accurate layer between the a reasonably accurate registration between the layers. And could you imagine with 40 layers, which is quite common um, in certain, uh, certain kinds of applications, uh, there are many, many layers to make sure they line up. So, we got to take care of that, and if that doesn't line up, the board doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So, it is a, it's a crucial factor as we as we're moving forward with uh, you know with with uh, higher and higher frequencies and more um, uh, tighter tolerances. So, uh, but hundred, so, hundred micrometers is actually quite a lot in your table. I think it was hundred plus minus hundred micro hundred fifty. I think yes, hundred fifty mi mi micrometers. Because uh, sometimes uh, you may have track. Uh, like 75 micrometers uh, so yeah. you, if the registration is plus minus 150 that's like oh. <laughs> that, that, that's over the whole board so i'm talking ah, about whole board over okay the whole, over, the whole, over the whole panel so not just on the individual okay the whole... okay i was like <laughs> uh, yeah you're right <laughs> um the same, the same with the, you know, with the uh, the thickness on the whole board. I get it across the whole board. So hundred microns across the whole board. Yes, if it was if it was individually layer by layer, <laughs> would, uh, you completely would be missed the track. Um, yeah. So typically, when it, when it comes to the whole board, you can talk about the the, the um, you know the dimension stability we're looking at on the whole board is in the ppm range, hundreds of ppm range. Um, so imagine that. So take the whole panel, which might be might be 24 inches or 18 inches, whatever, plus minus 100 microns on the whole panel. So you have to then scale that back. But whatever whatever the number is, it's it had to be improved by, you know, from 150 to 100, it has to be improved by, by basically a third mm -hmm. from here to here. And it may have to improve again by even another half possibly from 100 to 50 microns. That's probably going to be the next the next layer requirement here. So the point to make is uh, there is a requirement and that requirement has become tighter and it will become tighter still. I think mm -hmm. that's the message that we want to really get across.
Okay. Um, are there any other like very interesting uh, pages? Because yeah, now I think we are getting close to. <laughs> goes a long time. Well, I'll, I'll talk about one very, very final thing. Okay. Uh, which again is something for the designer and something for the the board shop. We talked about uh, dietary constant before, and we talked about uh, dissipation factor. Dissipation factor lowering it is always a good thing. Dietary constant is actually is actually a design parameter, and there's a so-called impedance triangle I want to mention. So if we take um, 55 ohm impedance and we take uh, the same DF and we take the same the same uh, track width, basically uh, this trace to its reference ground plane with a, a DK of 3.5 has a particular spacing of f five mils in this case. Um, and if you want to actually, um, um, you know, to actually make that, that same impedance, uh, it, then uh, yeah. you and you would like to go closer to the reference plane, then yes. you have to make it uh, thinner. Exactly. Thinner. So the track is to go from five mils not to over, four mils. Not over. Or, uh, not over. And of course, you may want to do that. That's fine. But of course, it does put a bigger burden on the manufacturer because a, th a thinner trace means you have you have uh, worse yields. Mm -hmm. If you go over here, though, to the second side, for example, if we take a DK of 2.8 instead now, so we reduce the, the, the delta constant of the material, we can go closer with the same width. Mm -hmm. So that is a, a design uh, a design advantage for, for manufacturing. So saying the same story in a different way, um, here is reference plane and here is the circuit traces. Uh, these now are, are different widths in this case. So I've got a, a, a five mil trace with a DK of four. If I can get a DK of 2.7 for the same spacing and the same impedance, I can get away with an eight mil trace instead, mm -hmm. higher yields. So that is a that is what the DK means as a, as a design parameter. We can actually get thicker traces or they can be uh, closer to the reference plane. Yes. Again, same story here. This is the yes. reference plane. This is same so, width but closer. Okay. It, exactly. So you know, DK four means you've got to be up here. DK DK two point seven means you can get that trace same width even closer down, and that's the kind of uh, impedance triangle uh, we talk. So so what I'm saying is, uh, dietary constant can also be a big advantage for the designer as a design parameter to to make the board more producible and more or higher yields, let's say, in the manufacturing. So that is the, the kind of message I wanted to get across there. So which one is uh, more producible, wider tracks? You can, you can make wider tracks. Wider tracks actually is probably the biggest benefit to the board shop. Wider tracks means higher yields, generally. Um, but of course, you may want to do this as well. Sorry, come to here, to get the, the spacings lower. To That's make what I always try to do, yeah. Make the board thinner, yeah. So that again is a big advantage. Not even so, yeah. thinner, but uh, uh, there are some benefits, uh, like for high speed signals, so uh, putting them closer to the reference plane. Okay, so that that would be exactly where you'd need the lower DK. So as a designer, two advantages here: close to the reference plane and wider traces. So both those things are positive for the, you know, for the board shop and also for your signal integrity as well. In, mm -hmm. in that. So, they're, they're two good things to do. So that was the last thing I wanted to sort of really talk about. Uh, okay, uh, so I ask many, many questions. Can you just quickly go through the slides if there is something uh, what will catch my eye, like maybe... Uh, this is quite a nice board. It's a so-called camel circuit. This fits into oil. So we've talked about mainly um, mainly rigid materials, mm -hmm. you know, glass fibers, and I've talked about um, you know resin systems. Many of these materials here don't have any reinforcement at all. They're mm -hmm. made on polyamide films or other films. And there is actually um, traditionally a lot of these kind of circuits in, in military and high reliability applications. This is a, a, a missile board, for example, you know, many boards that are sort of round in shape sort of give you an idea. That's the kind of kind of use. Um, but actually, um, they're also used very, very widely in, in, in smartphones for these modules. These little camera modules here and, and different modules that we have in the phone all have flexible connectors and if you do break down uh, a phone you know, uh, uh, tear it down or look in things like um, uh, like like printers inkjet printers for example you will find many of these circuit modules having these flexible connectors in there so i haven't really mentioned them very very much but there is a, a big growth in that area now ev applications also have, have a lot of these for things like battery connectors so um massive areas and, and i you know i want to just sort of mention this is this is the very last slide i think we haven't looked at um i talked about polyamide not performing very very well very very well in in, in low loss applications because of the high water absorption typically there's a whole range of other materials now the pet materials pm materials and liquid crystal polymer materials that are becoming broadening the range now for flexible as well mm -hmm. so again it depends on the application area here so pen films are generally low uh, low moisture absorption 
and we're seeing these in laminated bus bars, which are being pretty pretty heavily used now in EV battery applications for monitoring, also for connectors for the batteries. You know, this again is a big area, high current um, and flexible because these have to fit into the space available within, a, within an automobile. Um, and PET film is widely used again for these, generally low, low complexity applications. So we're not talking about high reliability here necessarily, or, or let's say not leading edge technologies, but automotive looms is quite interesting. So just for standard wiring looms that are not going to see any particular excursions of temperature, PT films can be quite, quite widely used. And there's also applications there in, in, in aircraft, which um, uh, are being thought of as well to try and make the, the wiring looms flat rather than made from, from round wires. And liquid crystal polymer films, um, uh, we're finding lots of use of these now in low loss uh, applications. So you're seeing those in ICG packet in IC packaging now, which again is a massive market. IC packaging is around 20% of the total volume of PCBs now worldwide and, and, and looking to grow massively. Um, so again, the PCBs are used inside of the uh, are part of the components? Or the yes, component? exactly. So, okay. so embedding ICs, for example, uh, putting them onto the onto the PCB. So, um, you know, chip on board or, or embedded uh, embedded uh, um, components. So again, a massive a massive area of growth. Um, and we are seeing those in the, the millimeter wave and the 5G area and radar antenna as well for LCP, LC, LCP films. So there are quite a range of materials being used there. And also what's called build-up materials. I mentioned before about the smartphone. Uh, and there are quite, quite a few of those um, uh, materials around, uh, especially in Asia. You know, we don't make smartphones in Europe or the USA anymore, uh, pretty much. Uh, they're all made in Asia using, using very, very different technologies completely. So how um, does it work when you, when you mention this? I'm curious. So so built in always being basically you can you can build up uh, you can build up connections on different layers without having to drill holes through basically so you can actually put a layer on there you can metalize that layer put conductors only where you want the conductors to be put another layer metalize that layer and just carry on building these these layers up and up and up um, there's a lot of technologies that are used for that and again that would cover an entirely entirely different discussion um, but an Asian story and entirely uh, it's it's what is used in the in the smartphones completely uh, there's the Ajinomoto build-up film the ABF which you could look up uh, very very widely used in Asia um, for this kind of technology so it means you can make very very thin thin layers um, which means you can have lots of layers in a very very thin space you know a, a, a smartphone requires uh, requires that to be a big consideration. You can't end up with a smartphone that's half an inch thick. It really wouldn't wouldn't work. And there's a lot of complexity in the smartphones now, and of course, um, uh, embedded um, embedded components uh, and embedded. It was, uh, it was my well. next question. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and of course, you can embed you can embed antennas on, antennas onto chips now as well. Of course, that's that's also a technology. So within the within these boards, you have a lot of complexity uh, of the embedded devices. Uh, an antenna as well. So uh, a really interesting area, by the way. I mean, I, I did show the, the, the uh, you know, the teardown here of what goes on. I mean, um, uh, these are quite fascinating. I mean, when you see some of these circuit boards here and the complexity and the way these things are built, again, I, I don't have a, a, a breakdown to show you right now, teardown to show you right now, uh, but there's a, there's a whole massive uh, area of interest. But if you um, have something like this, we could make video on this topic. I would be interested to see actually and understand how it is built because I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, absolutely we could. I mean, there, again, we could look at the different technologies of that as well. Uh, and actually I could prepare something for that as well. Uh, absolutely, I'd, I'd love to do that. People um, can leave comments if they would like to see something like this. <laughs> it's it's not an area of, of, of great uh, manufacturing interest in Europe and USA, but of course we all use these things. You know, smartphones are an absolute part of our life. I, I'm not sure I can manage without one anymore. <laughs> uh, and tablets as well, you know, massive, uh, uh, massive growth in these areas. Um, so, so again, they're all being built using these build technologies now um, because of, of the requirement for the, the size, the space. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, and, the, and the price point, by the way, as well, you know, these things have to be made in, you know, in very, very efficient ways. You know, they are pretty expensive as they exist. But if you try to make those in, you know, in a European context, as they used to be made, the cost would be out of reach probably for many people. So we need to make these things in, in, in areas of the world where we can produce these designs, very high sophistication uh, and also at low cost. And that really is a, is a very, a very important point here. So I say cost effective here that really matters the fabrication of portable devices such as smartphones and tablets thank you thank you thank you so much for uh, 
all this information I learn a lot and uh, yeah if people are interested to learn more leave comments uh, what uh, what they would like to learn about and maybe we can make also another video about uh, PCBs materials and how they are built. No, thanks Robert very much for the opportunity. I, I've really enjoyed uh, talking to you so uh, thank you so much for, for arranging this in the first place. I really appreciate it. And uh, that's everything. Thank you very much for watching this video. By the way, we are preparing some very interesting tutorials, so if you don't want to miss them, hit the subscribe button. If you want, you can also check out our Fedevel online courses, where you will find everything important from basic board design up to advanced hardware design and PCB layout. The link is in the description. That's all for this video. Thank you again. Don't forget to leave your comments and see you next time. Bye.